pathway. And the other is the sort of conceptual way, which is meiosis and chromosomes flying around and changing. So both are at work, but like I said, the math way can get you a lot of the way there. And I think the conceptual kind of comes with that after you do enough of the problems and feel pretty comfortable with the math way. Because it makes sense that if these two genes are located really close on a chromosome, that a crossover is very rarely going to split the difference right between the two and thus make a mix of these two genes if they're on the same link. So given that, that's why you're always going to see recombinants or crossed over recombined genes. They're typically going to be the low number here. And kind of like we followed through last time. Step number one, you find that total. It's the total of everybody here. Step number two, you do all your recombinants over your total. And what percent does that equal? Because that percent and that frequency, that is the chance that a crossing over event happens to split these two genes, which we can infer then as distance. That a small chance means there's a small window to hit. This is how we had to map chromosomes back in the day. To this day, this still has a lot of use with immuno immunology, with your sense receptors. A lot of genes are built in big lines, basically, that are all coordinated together. So linkage still matters quite a bit when it comes to sensory and immunology. So we ended, and we kind of showed, this is how you do one gene, you know, two genes related to each other. What's the distance between those? But things can get a little different. Three. So before we hit this, we're going to do this together. I'm not going to do one of those things where I kind of push you in and hope you swim in the ocean type thing. That's not how, it's not a good way to learn these. First thing, first step is just that we're just going to engineer a couple parents. So this parental generation, the entire goal here is to make this heterozygote right here. See that? Because in any linkage problem, you're always going to have a fully heterozygous parent and a fully recessive parent. Now, the reason behind that is that we can't even do any of the measurements if I ever made this more complicated. We can't make it more complicated here. So the whole goal of the parental is to get right here, to a heterozygote, male or female, it doesn't matter. We're going to set them up in a mating cross with a fully recessive individual for each of these three genes that we're looking at. And the reason here, this is when I use the, the term sky and blue right here. If we want to assume this is the male, this is just a tool. Because every time, it doesn't matter how many crossing overs happen between these two alleles or these two or these two, it's always going to be the same. So let's assume if this is the male, this in this case, let's just assume it's just always donating the same thing. That means that the question can come over here. And we can say, how many splits are happening between these alleles, or these, or these, as they relate to each of these genes? So you'll see numbers typically set up something along these lines after crossing these F1s in an F2. So given that I'm kind of setting you up for this, so the first part of any question, there's one way I can ask an exam question, which is going to be, hey, look, here's a Mendelian cross, a weird. What does this look like? Does this look like X-linked inheritance? Does this look like penetrance expressivity or are they linked genes? And if the data shows that there's just this massive skew towards one of the sets, light it up in your head that this is a linked gene. So that's a very easy conceptual way to test this even using the math without having you do the equation. So next piece. Remember things that do not recombine and do not cross over, we call those parentals. Given that crossing over is a rare event, and there are very many of these, which one of these sets of offspring is the parentals? You don't have to shout it out. This is also a good time again to sort of pair up with somebody next to you and see if you can collaborate and make sure you're on the same page. See how the numbers kind of fly on this first example here, right? 
parentals are typically going to be of the numbers. Crossing over is a rare event. It's going to make a lot of sense that those top two numbers out of this total, those are the parentals. I'll go ahead and say, oops. Okay. What this means is that these are the allele sets that are just incoming as they are from mom here in red. So she's got one, well, I gotta highlight something conceptual here. Remember that each one of these, each one of these little recessives, one of them is coming from the dad, remember? So in blue, dad, 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 dad. And then if we're moving on, which one's coming from mom, this is where things get, this is where we can start seeing data start split. She can either donate this allele or this allele. She can donate this one or this one, this one or this one. So if you want to keep drawing along at this point, what you can say based on these data is that if this is my massive chromosome over here, remember the mom's got two of them. On one side, she has all three of her dominants on this chromosome. She has all three of her recessives on this one. Now this setup can change. The math system won't necessarily lose track of that. This is more I'm kind of showing you what this looks like visual side by side. Okay. So typically on the math side, the shortcut is going to be the higher numbers of the parentals because they didn't have it crossing over and that's more likely. Equally, what's the total here? That's step number one, right? Make sure you got the same total as whoever else next to you, because that's a, that's a quick way to lose track sometimes, my bad. Let me get the numbers up there. I will say this is about as hard as I can get on the exam as a three gene. All right, everybody's settling in around number around 700 and 40. Yeah, good job. Okay. So whenever you see these weird numbers, just go find the total to start. Sweet. Okay. So we have this number, but we have a lot of recombinants and different genes, right? Here's how to handle this. This is the easy, this is the way that I was taught, and I find it to be the easiest way because the other ways are a little more complicated and annoying to me. So if you have this printed out or you don't at this point, hopefully you have a little key info here and we do have the recording so you can always go back and like kind of rewatch this. So to begin, I'll have to, I'll have to do some erasing with this. Why don't we just get this up here for everybody? There we go. Okay, so if I wanna know the distance between gene F and gene B, there's a couple pieces that I have to go after. Now, if I want to know that, one of the easiest ways, if you're seeing this on the exam, is to put your pencil over H. So I'm going to do that by crossing it out on here. I don't much care for the H gene right now. I just want F to be. Because what we're going to do is we're going to find the distance between two genes at a time and then put the whole thing together. Doing it the other way is a nightmare. So given this, now we're down to a single gene cross, but there's some data flying around. So let's look how to look at it. 
This combination, these two right here, represent the parentals. If the allele sets look like this, they are not recombinants, they are parentals, right? So let's go look down here. That does not look like one of these two, does it? Because you're looking for both dominants and or both recessives, right? So these two, we can actually count as recombinants here with F to B, okay? So I'll do recombinants in blue. Looking down here at these two, these are actually representative. They're the same set as the ones on top, right? They're the same parentals. So there was no crossover with those ones between F and B. So those are parentals, don't count them as recombinants. Down here, these little ones, there is a change, right? Because we'd expect double recessives up here, and this is a recessive B right here. There's a recessive F over here. Perfect. Since these ones on the bottom do not look like these two, as far as alleles, count those as recombinants too. Cool. So just in general, distance F to B, we have a total 40, 33, 4, and 2. These are our recombinants for the just the distance between gene F and gene B. Find that total, divide that, that total of recombinants divided the, by the whole total of the offspring, 740. You come to a number, see if the people around you have that same number. And you can keep it in a decimal or you can times it by 100 to have a percent. Doesn't matter to me. Because what we're finding is the odds of a crossing over event happening. Okay. Everybody come to a sort of consensus with the people around them. You can give me kind of middle, no, or yeah, we're good. Okay. All right. Feeling that pretty good. It'll look something like this, that this total is 79. That's going to be over 740. And that's going to equal 0 0.107, otherwise known as 10.7%. Okay, so it's okay if this one, there was a step missed. I'm gonna do one more, then I'm gonna set you loose on the last one. Remember, there's three relationships in three genes, F to B, B to H, and F to H. So all you have to do is just find two gene distances each time. Okay, so we've got F to B, that's all set, we're done. Going back, you kind of have to reset the process if we're looking at two different genes, right? So I'm gonna go ahead and erase everything that we had before. Might take me an annoying amount of time, sorry. So if I wanna know the distance now between B and H, let's get rid of F, right? We don't want that in our way when we're considering all this. So on an exam, like I said, the typical way that I would do these is just put my pencil over 
a portion that I'm not working with at that point, like how I'm crossing out here. Okay, so again, this cross, if we're calling red parentals, pretty sweet. The way that she, her chromosomes are set up make this pretty easy, right? We just have to follow for either two recessives or two dominants. Those are parentals and those do thus not count between B and H. Okay, so the first two set right here, these two look pretty identical to the ones upstairs, right? If they're parentals, it means there was no crossover with these offspring during that period. So these can just be parentals. We're not counting them. Immediately right here, though, you see the deviation of alleles from the originals, right? Given that there's been sort of a switch right here. We call these recombinants. Equally, we see a different switch happened right here. Compared to those normals. So remember what the normals look like versus what these all these recombinants have started to look like. I will typically be nice enough to pair up reciprocal sets next to one another in the data. And I say typical because the only way I wouldn't is if I made a mistake for some reason, but I set these problems up the same way most times because the concept, the outcome is the same thing no matter what that I want you to get across. Okay, B to H, let's scroll down here and make some more, more room down here. B to H demands that 59, 44, four and two were our recombinants. Sorry, I'm kind of scrolling and flying around a little bit. That out of our way. So again, B and H recombinants over giant 740 total. So add the recombinants, divide by the total. And again, what you're finding is the odds of crossover events striking between those two genes. That total right here is 109 as 740. What is the number that people keep settling on? Is it about, well, why don't we give it a rest here? I'll, I'll settle for a bit, sorry. So kind of flash me a thumbs up or a middle if you're done. Okay. Hang on. Okay. So in that case, this number is going to work out right about to. 1.47. Does that sound pretty good? Okay. Sweet. So we have two distances right now. So technically, at certain points in a problem, could you put two distances together and sort of infer the next one? We actually don't know if the other, the last one is actually shorter than these two, though. So it's typically going to pay on one of these problems to just do all three sets and make sure you got everything. All right, last one and sort of visually the most annoying, sadly. F to H, what is that distance going to be? In this case, I want you to figure it out. We'll take about a little over 60 seconds, see if you can handle that that quickly.
if both you and the people next to you seem to come to that same answer, you're probably right. This is sort of the benefit of checking yourself. I don't know what these little numbers were. All right, last one, everybody feel all right? Okay. So in this case, I'm gonna cross out B since that's the one we don't care about and then I have to be the most careful when I'm crossing out, there we go. Okay, so what do our parentals look like? Again, dominant versus recessive only. So in this case, right here out of the gate, this one is different. These ones are different than the parentals and these littles actually are the only ones that are the same. So F H is going to be 40, 33, 59, and 44 offspring all pooled together. Going to equal 176 offspring out of that 740. And this is actually a pretty decently high number, not quite. So still crossing over distance wise, but still pretty high. So conceptually, the higher number here means that they are greater distance. And we know that because crossing over happens more often in that case. That's the, that's the connection between the math side of this and the conceptual side. So equally, if I had you guys map this on a chromosome, for example, and the distances were 23, 14, and 10, go ahead and sketch out what that would look like in your notes. Remember the tip that I told you for mapping, start with the biggest distance first, just plot it out right there, and then find which way directionally that mid, those middle genes would go. In our case, there's only one middle gene, so that's easy. All right, so I'll do it up at the top here. I'm just gonna say F all the way over to H. You're just gonna be able to call that to about 23. And you can call that centimorgans percent, whatever. They're the same thing. Equally, I know that B is closer to F than it is to H. I'd put that right about here and that's about, because that's about 10. And then over here, it's about 14. Now, as we're looking at this little crowded little sketch that I've made over here, that's an annoying amount of error, isn't it? There's a whole little piece in there that doesn't fit. It wasn't an exact match between the two distances, was it? What a pain in the ass because of these two. Why were these so, so rare? What was their role this whole time? If we zoom back up here and look at mom and look at the crossover events, 
One could happen right there, right? And that's going to split the difference between B and H. Okay. One could happen here. That's going to split the difference between F to D. Right. And any of those events are going to split F to H, right? Because anything in the middle of those two. So what do those really small ones come from? Let's see if two events happen simultaneously, two crossing overs in a rare spot. Double the odds. So imagine rolling snake eyes not once, but twice. The odds of that, very small. So what these little guys down here are, these really rare offspring, you can call these DCs or double crossovers. And they're how we reconcile that error in the, in the full math. And it's also why they do not show up as recombinants when you're looking at F and H. Because if you're just looking at F and H, Watch this. Let's say you're starting up here. You're going, you cross over once, you cross over again. You still started with these two, right? See that path? How two crossovers are just going to make the same one if you're just looking at one gene in that case. This might be one of the recordings I'm going to leave up for a while because I do like look, going back and looking at, looking at stuff like this when I learned it. So because there's a lot of concept and a lot of math flying all at once. So DCs can also be inferred from not only their raw amount here. So if we just want to do a little corner up here, this is just going to be six out of the 740, right? That's going to be a certain number. You'll find that it's highly rare and you can get the exact observed percent for the total number of double crossovers in that range. Our case, I believe it is something along these lines. Equally, you can infer the chances of a double crossover by saying the chances of a crossover between one gene that's in the middle, and then another gene in the middle, right? Multiply these numbers as decimals. And what, what number is that? Because that's chance of one event happening and the other. So it's the same thing as double crossover. It's another way to get to that inference. you'll find that that number is a little different again than our observed 0 0.008. The number we get from this one is going to be about 1.15. So there's multiple ways that you can sort of reconcile double crossovers. The reason why the two last little bits of math we just did are different is that once the crossing over machinery engineers and forms a crossover, it sort of makes it highly even more unlikely that it does in real life because that crossover area is so busy that it actually shoes away any other potential crossover sites. So that's why statistically it's always going to appear a little less likely than you would have expected it. And that's a biology detail. Basically, the biochemical machinery that does crossing over can't fit in that tight space twice. Okay. So, still evil, still hard. The math way to do these problems, so we're done, don't worry. The math way to do these problems is, I think, the best way to problem solve, learn it. You start to feel comfortable seeing the numbers, how they start to appear on problems. 
from that point, it becomes a lot easier to conceptually say, okay, now I'm gonna map this chromosome in my head. It makes sense that these two genes, B and C, are gonna have a lot uh, smaller chance to have that event happen. Equally, if there was a double between A and B and C, that's why that number would be so small and that those alleles would be the rarest in the math. So whenever you see a problem, it will be set up somewhat similar to this. Parentals are gonna be the highs. Double recombinants, double crossover is gonna be the lows, the very low ones. Typically an exam multiple choice can be as simple and devastating as which is the longest distance, which can typically call for you to try and do all three at least. Now, the more of these you do and the more comfortable you get and the more conceptually you're, you get good in that second stage conceptually, you may be able to look at this and just know it based on the numbers. The numbers and what they line up as. Okay. These slides are all posted. It's a little bit of a recap of what we did. That practice problem is representative of anything I put on the exam. I will not go farther than that. That's about, that's about it. That's why I really do hope that everybody does well on these because I don't overdo it with linkage, I'd say. It's an important concept and good problem solving. And it is important for like those immunology and sensory genes that are in big groups. And the more the math that you do, the better. I'll try and post some um, early practice style stuff coming up. And um, I'm not 100% on the little Wednesday review right now if we were going to do one because an exam was just last week, but we'll see. Okay. So go ahead and take a break. Hooray, you did it. That's the linkage part of the class for the most part. Oh yeah, if you haven't already, now's a good time to come search for your notes because now there's actually not too many of them left. You want those back. All right, you guys still have a little bit here, so you can either chill or I'll uh, kind of cover something not class, well, not a concept related. All right, so stats and bath on the exam. There's your spread and a really nice violin plot. If the person who didn't show and got the zero is here today, please find me or drop the class because I think you might not think you have not dropped the class. Equally, find me if this did not meet your goals. This is the raw exam percent. Mm, 
not where I thought we, it would hit, sadly, but data is the data. There's certain things that I can take from this to help. Equally, like I said, some of you did receive a random point added. That's because one of the questions was super hard, and I think it was a little too hard. There was a certain level of detail with one of the questions that I think that was more on me then. It was too much of a challenge. Now, what that means is that if you got that one right, you get full credit. But if you didn't, some of the points on that came back to you because I felt as though maybe that shouldn't have been as value as high. Everything else, pretty decent. Ray, two other pieces of data. We did have some people do better on the exam than they did the quiz. Although, sadly, for the most part, this is typically what happens in genetics where the first quiz was pretty, a lot of stuff that you'd either seen before and or if had seen the class before you, you felt pretty comfortable with. The next one is not quite as much. Equally expected versus actual scores. I always take that data as sort of a read on things. If you didn't meet your expectation, that's a good sign to find me to figure it out, to re-strategize, and that's okay. Okay, something a little different here too. A little metric I made called class presence out of 10. All it is is how much stuff you do when you're in class, when you're not, how engaged are you, things like that. And I can coalesce that into a number. On the bottom is the exam percent. And as you can tell, there's sort of a somewhat obvious trend, as you can tell. I don't do that for the trend. The trend's obvious, everybody knows that. I do this so that I can find these people. People that are engaged in the class, but they didn't quite meet their goals. Like these are the people that I would want to help, for example. Those are the people that I want to make sure to have that final push. Equally, you can see in the lower right, there are some people that are sort of ghosts in the class, but they do quite well. It's so good for them. My PDFs are art then. It's good. Okay. Equally, again, if you classed, if I, if I classified you as somebody who is highly engaged up to the point, here's your exam score in green versus somebody who wasn't. Now, equally, those that were lower on the green side, I do want to reach out and help and see what we can do. And obviously, reach out to me if you know, you are maybe in that red side right now and you want to change those circumstances. That's what I'm here for. I want to help everybody cross this finish line, but you got to score the points. Okay. Ray, how evil. Sorry. I, I know I can't really do my squid game jokes anymore because I didn't, I feel like it was too low. So if it's a high exam, I'll do the squid game jokes. Sorry. Okay. On to something again. Good news here again, not everything's going to be a puzzle solved for inheritance. Yeah, there's going to be a pedigree or two on the next exam. Yes, there's going to be linkage. Those are problem solving style stuff. We are going to be able to get into some contrasting genetics, different organisms, first of which is going to be prokaryotes. Look at those gross little things. Simplest units of life, highly effective. And so for those of you that are more conceptual, this is where your strengths and your points are going to come from in the next portion of this class. So if you, a good way to study the prokaryote section is on the margins or later in your notes in a different color, go and keep finding all the differences between eukaryotic genetics and prokaryote genetics that I sort of highlight and hammer away. First one is in blue text here because I don't need you to know the cycles of everything that's different, but I do need to know, I do need you to know that prokaryotes and these other organisms, they do replicate and they do sustain life differently than eukaryotes do. Everything we've done to this point has dealt with meiosis, right? Two organisms coming together, splitting into gametes, coming together, making a new varied organism. The systems you see above are one way that we can kind of buck that trend, a little different. You don't always have to give half your gametes. Just like the fungi. And those of you that I have in lab have probably kind of done too much about this already. But fungi are highly adaptable, and they are a very interesting form of life because they can clone themselves, and that's good if the environment's steady, right? If the environment's good and your genes are good, keep making more of that, right? Why vary anything about that if you're the right fit at the right time? You don't need to know, yeah, so the main things here, you don't need to know the full cycle or the names on this, just that they can clone themselves or 
they can start doing sexual reproduction. Just like we did on the plate, two mating types can come together to form a diploid that will have variable genetics and they'll mix around. So suddenly if the environment changes and there's some sort of catastrophe, fungi have the ability to reset and decide we do need one offspring that can survive whatever we're doing right now. That's an interesting thing. We don't have, we have parasitologists, we have virologists, we have bacteriologists. We don't have very many mycologists when it comes to medicine because fungi typically degrade at 37 degrees, which is about the heat of a warm blooded mammal. Now, as the equator gets hotter, unfortunately, fungi are becoming <clears throat> better at that temperature though. So we'll see what happens in about 20 years. But off to our main character for the day, bacteria, prokaryotes, binary fission, you're just making a clone. One cell becomes two exact copies, no messing around. You do have something along the line of an S phase with binary fission, it's not called that. You just double your genome because it's just in one big pile. See that? Nope, sorry, I'm trying to get this. There's no chromosomes either. It's one big giant nucleoid. This isn't a cell biology class. You don't need to know, you know, there's no nucleus, there's no organelles, I don't care. Anything DNA related though, I do care. A nice clean split, there's you no know, crossing over, there's no messing with anything, there's no phases really, it's just pull these apart. Two nice copies, so yeah, it's a little bit more like mitosis, a little less complicated. little small detail there is that polymerases in bacteria are highly accurate because you kind of note that in one slide down. So one of the advantages of this, let's say just ecologically, is that more, more is better. So not even counting the speed of these things. Four meiosis producing organisms can only pair up and make so many. But for a sexual reproduction cloning ones, just off to the races, exponential. And that's why you see that in microbiology. Oop, just like that, big exponential curve. Now, nobody's saying that sexual reproduction is bad. Look at all these variable offspring, right? Versus all the clones. A bit of an issue, right? A bit of a weakness for the bacteria. Hmm, sorry, I don't know why the slide's in here. It's just funny. Okay. And like to, yeah, to note, it's also a good note to say like, this is the final simplest thing that can be considered fully living. Metabolism, energy, reproduction, the whole thing. So. But the key difference here is, yeah, don't have to variable your offspring. And like we saw, this is a pretty sweet picture. This is the bacterial genome. And I kind of made that note up there where, again, there are no chromosomes. They're not organized by any means, really. So I'd say that's one here. I know this is a green text, but let me add two things. What I mean in point number two with highly flexible is that if suddenly the environment changes and the bacteria needs something, it just activates that gene. There's no decisions. There's no running to the nucleus to decide. It's just there very quick. So the minute you give bacteria something to try and kill them, even antibiotic, they will immediately start engineering things to react to that new environment. So it's very, very fast.
Okay. Two pieces about the genome. Here's that gigantic pile like we talked about a DNA. We can call that a nucleotide. You can call it the chromosome. You can call it the genome. Doesn't matter. That's just this big pile of DNA. And each bacteria has got one. But equally, there are something, there's something different about the bacterial genome. And that it's sort of more a la carte, if that makes sense. There are little pieces of DNA called plasmids that exist in bacteria, and they're really small, and they may only contain one to two genes, right? The cool thing with plasmids is that they're sort of selectable. Bacteria can decide, I want these four plasmids and maybe not these three in this environment. I want these 12 plasmids in a hot environment, and we can kick out my old four. When we were talking about that rigidity of cloning, plasmids are what offer the flexibility as far as the full genome to a bacteria. Yeah, choose your advantage, choose your fighter, whatever you want to call it. Because each of these may only have like one, maybe two, three genes on it. These little units represent a very unique piece of sort of an advantage with prokaryotes. We do not have plasmids in our DNA. We do not have that selection possibility. We don't have that flexibility. Now, one issue here. Can this big pile, since we have no chromosomes, we have no homologous chromosomes, we have no like regions, right? Can that cross over and recombine and help itself out? Got nothing, no. It's got one copy of most genes. And that's gonna mean that if you get a mutation, it's gonna be felt hard through those generations, right? There's no switching, there's no crossing over, there's no hope that an offspring doesn't have that mutation. So again, in your pile of differences, there's no crossing over, there's no recombination. Nucleoid you have is the one you have. We will cover an exception to this, but should it come on an exam question of what is a difference between binary fission and or like bacteria genetics and eukaryogenetics? Bacteria do not have the typical crossing over machinery that we consider necessary. So at least there's no linkage with bacteria. That's good, right? But as you can tell, once a mutation is there, it's going to get split, copied, and these are going to make their own too. That's going to be felt for very quickly. So this is more just the reminder slide, which is DNA is the information sort of held, held normal so that you can get to the protein, and the protein is what does stuff. So when you think of a transporter that spits out antibiotics, that is a protein in the surface of the bacteria, but it comes from a DNA gene, from DNA sequence. So fun stuff. This is just blue because it's not a microbiology class, but bacteria are built to survive at different environments. They're very good. At, you know, some of them are hot. Some of them are cold. Some of them are good in salt. Some of them are good at you know, massive ocean pressure. They kind of can run the gambit. Importantly, and how we can take advantage of this, is that certain bacteria only eat certain things. So we can isolate bacteria. Let's say we have a big pile, like a vat of bacteria with a bunch, but let's say we put it on a plate that only feeds a certain type of bacteria, only that one kind is going to survive. That's a good way that we can isolate stuff. I just talked about that, yeah. And those of you that have taken micro, this is pretty boring, you know what I'm talking about. But the genes necessary to eat certain stuff that's a very good differentiating characteristic with any bacteria. And little small plug, difference between bacteria and archaea. The split happens quite a ways ago with archaea. Um, so archaea are those weird like extremophiles. Fun story is that once bacteria started to harness oxygen and produce oxygen as a byproduct, 
oxygen's toxic to archaea. So it kind of extincted everything across the world and the archaea could only find places in extreme like hydrothermal vents, weird stuff. Given that the environment of an archaea is so extreme, none of them are bad for humans because they don't, they don't exist in us very well. We're not an extreme you know, environment. Now, as far as when the environment does work as a human, a lot of the time virulence does not come from the fact like this bacteria doesn't want to kill the host. It doesn't know any better. It just happens to produce a byproduct that fries up the host's immune system and brain. And this is what we know as bubonic plague, black death. Carried by fleas that, carried by mice, which mice follow cities. As you can tell, Ursina pestis is armed with several plasmids. Its own chromosome, its big DNA stain, but it comes with those little special pieces with those plasmids. It has certain advantages, certain advantages that allow it to evade or kill the immune system before, it's, before it can like start overcoming it. What happens today with medicine is when antibiotics or other means cannot stop a bacterial infection or your, or your immune system, you get something called sepsis. Bacteria, remember the growth, zip, just like that, can overwhelm everything in your body, eat, make byproducts, cause everything to go down. Sepsis is typically not something you want a patient to, to have. This is not something that's easily easy to overcome even with our best antibiotics. Last little bit, something called biofilm with bacteria. Biofilm is sort of a secretion. They sort of terraform the area they're around bacteria do. And even UV light can sometimes not penetrate the biofilm. And the biofilm allows bacteria to kind of share like all kinds of good like foods, things like that, and they can survive. So it's green text because I kind of want you to give you the, the adaptability of these things. Bleach and other hard disinfectants are typically the only way to actually get rid of biofilm, especially in a hospital setting. That's why it's kind of a tough, tough deal. Okay, so in blue, how are antibiotics used to defeat these things? Antibiotic mechanisms are good. I don't need you to know the details of this. That's why it's blue. But the fact is, is this is a big pool of differences between prokaryote genetics and eukaryote genetics. The ribosomes that translate the gene, they're different. The DNA itself is different. Bacterial wall, cell walls, we kill those off. Things that we're going to see with DNA we're going to see with DNA replication, they have different versions of those genes. So, so long as something's different in the bacteria that it is in humans, we can send a drug in to kill it because we don't want to kill anything that looks exactly like our cells. That's why the bacteria being different is always a sort of, this, is, this slide is full of um, differences between the two. So I think this, is, this actually loads in the PDF. This is a video. So even though they're asexual and they clone theoretically, they can rise and evolve very quickly. So over here on the left and the right, so they're both the same, there was like one nanomolar of antibiotic on this. There was 10 on this one, 100 on this one of antibiotic, 1,000 on this one, and then 10,000 on this one, concentration of antibiotic. And so you can sort of see you can see little pieces where like an evolution event happened and the resistance formed. And typically that resistance is going to be a way to defeat these means somehow. And that resistance is genetic. And typically the cool thing with bacteria, if you push them to survive, they will sometimes shut down. Remember all those editing mechanisms that make sure mutations don't happen? If it's do or die time, you can shut those down and hope that one of your babies basically makes it but I would advise clicking on this video. It's pretty nasty. So among all this, people always ask, how, what enemies does bacteria have? Why don't we see, you know, why is it so prevalent? How can something like this be out evolved ever? Is, does it have a predator basically? There's one thing that a bacteria cannot deal with. And it's a virus. 
Viruses versus bacteria has been the arms race for hundreds of millions of years. Pieces of this class that we'll see that we've taken from bacteria and used as biotechnology, it's typically a defense against viruses. What you're looking at here is the bacteriophage. And all it's doing is inserting this DNA inside the bacteria. What this DNA is going to do, it's going to become translated. It's going to make a bunch of pieces of those viruses and spit them out, start the process again. And the virus itself doesn't have the necessary things to do transcription, translation. It needs to be a parasite. And it's crazy that that's our actual shape. It looks sci-fi, but it's super nasty. Equally, if these things are clones, how do they transfer any information? How's that possible, right? And this was a question that was on a lot of people's mind. Why are there different species of bacteria and why do they keep out evolving our, our antibiotics? Why is there variation in something that should be cloning itself? So, quick story and then we'll be done. And you'll see where I'm going with this. 1918 flu, a lot of people dead. This was a unique influenza because it killed young people and it killed, or no, sorry, it killed sort of in the middle of the population. It didn't kill really young people. It didn't kill really old people. It killed sort of middle age, kind of everybody in this room like us, right? Not kind of scary. Didn't help that World War I was going on and the trenches are nasty, but still. The true killer, the 1918 flu, is a bacteria, two versions of this bacteria. Smooth versus rough. Typically what happens with a 1918 flu is immune system is exhausted and this little bacteria would move in. The smooth variant can evade the immune system. This looks like nothing to the immune system. The immune system's tired at this point and can't find anything. Now the rough variant, luckily these little spikes right here, they look really angry to the immune system and even what's left after the flu, it can go out and kill it. So scientists at this point, we're just trying to figure out how can we stop people from dying from this thing? So we had the two strains of this Nemococcus. Smooth variant is gonna kill all our lab mice, the rough variant, not so much. Could we find a weakness between these two and see why the smooth variant was so bad? So in an effort, a guy named Griffith tried an experiment, and I know you've probably seen this before. We'll zero in on experiment number one. So he gets the rough strain out, the one with the bumps on it, the immune system can figure it out. Puts it in the mouse, mouse doesn't die, perfect. We knew that. Smooth strain, this is the bad one. This is the one that evades the immune system. Mouse, dead. Dead face. Now, if you killed with heat the smooth strain that we just talked about, that virulent, so if you fry it up a little bit, okay, mouse in, mouse is fine. Perfect. Okay, so heat can kill it, great. The next step he did was sort of a stroke of luck. He took this heat killed version of the bad smooth strain, but he put it with living non virulent R strains, the non deadly version. Now, the problem was, is one way or another, the heat killed version still had something left to give. The mouse dies. So Griffith was this like kind of small, like I think he was like five feet tall, kind of, kind of a little short dude. He didn't realize what he'd found. Two things that happened with this experiment. So those to your left and your right, see what are the two things that sort of, what are one of the two things that sort of emerged from this? That at this point, remember, we didn't know what DNA looked like. We didn't know how bacteria worked. So along those lines, what did he just figure out right here? 
talk with those around you and see if you got the same ideas as them. sort of an abstract thing. And it's also hard not to be in the frame of mind everybody was at this time. Remember, this is the heat of eugenics, 1920, 1918, that's catching steam. You still don't technically know what the inheritance material is. What this experiment proved is that genes were real, they were physical. It was a chemical of some kind. But finding number one was more important. What we found was that some sort of inheritance material was given from that deadly strain to the non-deadly strain, despite the original bad one being dead. Chemical was still there. And that piece, that piece, that inheritance, that trait of deadliness, it came with it. equally and something that wouldn't be really seized upon for another 50 years is if the bad strain could give all the bad genes to the non-bad bacteria. If we could know what genes to give to a bacteria, couldn't we make it express almost anything? Number two wasn't really seized on quite as aggressively as it could have been. Number one was, though. Now, the problem was people didn't believe him. They were like, that's a complete lie. He repeated it hundreds of times, and they're just like, no. But that's the way things go sometimes. It doesn't take one experiment. Sometimes it takes two. Equally, everybody thought that the heritable unit must be proteins, because at this point, we're starting to get pretty good at visualizing proteins. And to this day, they're colorful, they're cool, they're really diverse, they're awesome. They do everything. It must be proteins that are inherited from mom to dad to son to daughter, right? So we did a quick thing. A guy named Avery did a quick experiment. He's going to repeat the experiment we just did. Heat killed deadly S bacteria. And we're going to do the transformation, that final fourth experiment that uh, Griffith did, where they're going to become bad, right? All we're going to do, we're going to mix this all up, hooray. We're going to make three trials. Trial number one, we're going to kill off all the protein in the tube. Trial number two, we're going to kill off all the RNA in the tube. Trial number three, we're going to kill off all the DNA in the tube. Given what was expected, it was expected that trial number one would prevent the expression of the genes, that proteins were the thing, that if you killed off the proteins, no inheritance could happen. But we kind of know which trial works in the end of this one, right? You kill off the DNA. That's the one that's not going to work. Only by killing off DNA did you see that the inheritance fails. You can kill off all the proteins, all the RNA, doesn't matter. So Avery's experiment built on Griffith's, but he found something way bigger. He found the heritable material, he found that it was DNA. Wasn't all powerful proteins, it wasn't lipids, it wasn't anything else, it wasn't RNA, as strange as RNA was. 
So people were pissed. Everybody was convinced in their right mind that it must be protein. So Avery runs this experiment, Griffith's done it. That's Nobel's type stuff, but nobody liked it. They all said that he's a quack and that they didn't like that very much. You know. So not super fun time. So he spent the rest of his career trying to get it. He got the Nobel posthumous, so that's at least something. And actually no break time can save you because I only have like two more slides. Well, sorry, six more slides, but Ray. So as far as the blue slide, antibiotic resistance that we kind of started with as a blue text, it's because one of them may have a plasmid that can resist just one. And if that one shares that plasmid, that little, remember those little circular a la cartes? They can just spit that out to all their bacteria, even after they've been like bleached or killed sometimes. And that DNA can get gobbled up by a piece of bacteria and now it's resistant too. That's variation in bacteria. We'll see this more officially. But variation in prokaryotes, a lot of that is gonna come from plasmids being shared and made amongst neighbors. The idea of basically having like sort of like somebody next to you and you can like physically hand them something and they can like have that trait suddenly. Sort of like the game Bioshock if there's any fans left. It's kind of old though. And once you have that resistant clone, it's gonna start spreading the plasmid everywhere too. because they don't even have to be related. They can literally just hand off DNA like it's a physical molecule, because, well, it is. That process is called transformation, because like, like you can tell, it transforms them into something bad. This is red text, not because I need you to know each piece, but I want you to see where a gene can show up and where maybe only one gene can get the job done. There are mechanisms that pump stuff out. There are, there are genes that chew up antibiotics the minute it shows up. There are alterations that can prevent certain bindings of bacteria to the DNA. And each one of these can be accomplished with maybe one, two genes, all from one little plasmid sometimes. And that transfer is very easy. So in the question where we originally started from, why don't these clones, why do they have variation? It's because they can easily just take a trait and use it immediately. It's not like us where we're kind of born with what we got and we got to use the cookbook. They can actually add recipes. Okay, last little bit as far as DNA goes. Uh, I think you saw this in intro, but it's based, I mean, well, obviously, A binds to T, G binds to C, hooray. Sweet. An easy way for me to test this is to say, you sample a tube of DNA nucleotides from something, from a chromosome that you ground up or something, right? It's 23% adenine. What are the other comp compositions of the other three? So if it's 23% A, and A must have a partner with T, okay? You gotta get to 100%, they're gonna match. So this is something called Shargoff's rule. I mean, you don't need to know that terms for the test, but this is where we're getting into the arena where I do need you to know A's and T's, G's and C's, but you got the note cards, so that's good. Okay, so kind of a story time to finish it out. This is the final structure of DNA that, um, so we knew DNA was the molecule, we need to know the structure. This is a complicated story, so I'll do the fast version, but you should read on your own because it's fun for some of them. 
So people had no idea what the molecule looked like. People were kind of guessing. A couple of physicists from California were like, oh, it's a triple helix, blah, blah, blah. Those of you with a biochem background, holy, look at all these things that are repelling each other right here. The original models of DNA with a triple helix would have exploded. There was so much chemical force packed into this thing. Now we're not exploding, so it's, they're wrong. Watson and Crick in their first try actually went to Rosalind Franklin and said, here's our proposal. It's a triple helix with a modification. It was described that she circled the model like a tiger and then ripped them apart in front of all their colleagues like children. It was apparently hilarious. Now, a critical contribution to this, an X-ray diffraction, was that a lot of Nazi scientists or a lot of German scientists got out before the Nazis got in power and they turned not to physics, but to biology. This was also had to deal with the fact the atom bomb had been made and a lot of physicists felt pretty bad about that. They turned to something different. Oops, it's time. Franklin figured out the double helix, Rosalind Franklin. She had the pieces. She had all the pieces. Crick and Watson, they built the model from the pieces that she, she didn't have that final step. This is something called getting scooped in science. Don't share your results on something good until, unless it's somebody you trust or they're finally published. And it wasn't actually Franklin that did it, it was her boss. He was like, here, take this picture. And that was it. I figured that was a helix. We'll cover a little bit more next time.